We have been led to believe that the sun goes down below a horizon as we roll away from it on our spinning ball earth. But when we allow ourselves to question, challenge, or even try to confirm our beliefs with real life observations, we allow ourselves to see what we really see.
In 1902, French filmmaker Georges Méliès created a visionary film which seemed to anticipate in many ways the Apollo missions to the moon of the 1960s. Méliès' film, of course, was just a fantasy. And the Apollo missions? Were they real, or were they just a modern and more sophisticated version of the same fantasy? The story of the Apollo missions began in 1961, when President Kennedy announced before the world that the United States intended to land a man on the moon before the end of the decade or before 1970. This caused quite a stir, as up to that point the United States had only been able to launch an astronaut, Alan Shepard, in a short suborbital flight of only 15 minutes. Never having even sent a man in Earth orbit, setting the goal of reaching the moon in less than nine years sounded like a far-fetched idea, to say the least. But it is at that point, according to the official narrative, that the United States set in motion a powerful technological machine that would actually allow them to reach the goal established by Kennedy a few months before the end of the decade, in July 1969. Those who don't believe that we went to the moon instead maintain that the United States did launch into this titanic enterprise, but they reached a point around 1967 in which they realized they could not overcome all the obstacles posed by such an ambitious project. And at that point, the only option left was to pretend to go to the moon. As they could not admit to the entire world that they were unable to achieve their goal, the United States would have chosen to fake the missions by using all the simulation systems they already had in place, which allowed them to replicate an entire lunar mission from beginning to end. For the people watching at home, it would have made no difference. Let's see now more in detail what happened during the historic decade of the lunar missions. History books tell us that in the 1960s, the so-called race to the moon took place. It refers to the competition between the United States and the Soviet Union about who could reach the moon first. If we take a closer look at the events, however, we will realize that it was actually a one-sided race without a real opponent. It was only the Americans who truly tried to the end, driven not so much by the competition with the Soviets, but rather by the monstrous propaganda machine they themselves had set in motion at the beginning of the decade. Officially, the so-called race to the moon began on April 12, 1961, when the Soviets managed to put into orbit the first human being, Yuri Gagarin. It was then that President Kennedy asked Vice President Johnson to assess what the actual possibilities were for the United States to beat the Russians into space. This is where a very important figure comes into the picture, NASA Administrator James E. Webb. Johnson consulted with Webb and a few days later returned to Kennedy with an answer. Among the contemplated possibilities, one was to send a man to the moon. Two weeks later, President Kennedy delivered the following speech in front of Congress. Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. From that moment on, NASA Administrator James Webb threw all his energies behind the Luna Project. From NASA's historical archives, we read, Webb, who had endorsed the Apollo program to Kennedy, now had his priorities fixed on the manned lunar landing, and he reorganized the space agency accordingly. An excellent mediator, Webb managed to gather the support from prominent political figures such as Senator Kerr from Oklahoma. From the NASA archives, we read, Kerr told his congressional colleagues that Webb was enthusiastic about the program and that if Jim Webb says we can land a man on the moon and bring him safely home, then it can be done. This endorsement, concludes the document, secured considerable political support for the Luna project. Behind the scenes, however, Kennedy remained skeptical about such a monumental task. 
On September 18, 1963, Kennedy summoned Webb at the White House to express his doubts about the Luna project. Thanks to a recently released recording, we can listen to the actual conversation between the two men. If I get re-elected, I'm not, we're not going to go to the moon in my, in our period, are we? Uh, where are we? Said, no, 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 you're not going. We're not going. Yeah. You fly by, huh? You think, that we, you think the, moon, the, the man landing on the moon is a good idea? Yes, I think Why? it is. Because? We can do the same with instruments much cheaper. No, sir, you can't do the same. The Luna landing gave us the impetus to build big boosters and to tailor them specifically for the purpose. Therefore, they're going to succeed. Otherwise, they would not have succeeded all that efficient. But this looks like a hell of a lot of dough to go to the moon when you can go and learn most of what you want scientifically through instruments. And putting a man on the moon really is a stunt, and it isn't worth that many billions. Only two days later, in front of the United Nations, Kennedy made one last attempt to engage the Soviets in going to the moon together. Finally, in a field where the United States and the Soviet Union have a special capacity in the field of space, there is room for new cooperation, for further joint efforts in the regulation and exploration of space. I include among these possibilities a joint expedition to the moon. Khrushchev's response was not long in coming, but it was certainly not encouraging. One month later, at a meeting with the foreign press, the chief of the Kremlin stated, At the present time, we do not plan flights of cosmonauts to the moon. I have read a report that the Americans wish to land on the moon by 1970. Well, let's wish them success, and we will see how they fly there, and how they will land there, or to be more correct, moon there, and most important, how they will get up and come back. We do not wish to compete in sending people to the moon without thorough preparation. They took off their hats. At that point, Kennedy realized that the die was cast and that the United States would have to go it alone. This nation has tossed its cap over the wall of space, and we have no choice but to follow it. The day after, in Dallas, John Kennedy was killed. But at that point, the Luna program had been launched and passed directly into the hands of the new president, Lyndon Johnson. In the meantime, the Soviets were still trying to develop a lunar program and were secretly training their cosmonauts for it. But their program ended abruptly for a number of different reasons. The first was the unexpected death of Sergei Korolev, the father of the Russian space program. During routine surgery in January 1966, Korolev died. The one figure with the authority and vision to galvanize the system behind the goal of beating the Americans had gone. The man who had launched the first satellite, Sputnik, who had put the first man in orbit, Gagarin, the man who had conceived the entire Soviet space program was gone without leaving a successor, and there was no one capable of replacing him at that point. This led to a series of internal divisions at the top of the Russian space agency, which resulted in a streak of dramatic disasters. Four heavy rockets of the new N1 kind, designed to reach the moon, exploded during testing on the ground. It was the end of the Soviet Luna program, as described by Roald Sagdeev, the former director of the Russian space agency. Very uh, few people uh, remember that in parallel with American uh, Apollo program, Soviets uh, attempted uh, to have their own program. But this uh, Soviet program on uh, kind of uh, counterpart to American Apollo, it failed. It failed because uh, the large ro rocket, uh, Russian counterpart to Saturn V, exploded several times, even without getting chance to, to uh, take off the launching site. In the meantime, the situation in the United States was rapidly changing. This evening, I came here to speak to you about Vietnam. I do not have to tell you that our people are profoundly concerned about that struggle. The Vietnam War now completely occupied the minds of the Americans, while ingurgitating an ever-increasing share of the national budget. At the same time, the cost of the Apollo program was spiraling out of control. As this documentary of the time explains, 
The cost of the Luna project had soared beyond all expectations, even before a single rocket had lifted off the ground. The status of fabrication and testing of Apollo hardware was such that the program had reached and passed its peak costs. Before a single manned Apollo mission was launched, the program itself began to go out of business. In fall of 1965, General Samuel C. Phillips, director of the Luna Landing Program, presented NASA executives with a report that exposed in no mild terms the state of confusion and shortcomings suffered by the Apollo program. In particular, Phillips pointed his finger on the command module and the second stage of the Saturn rocket, which had been contracted to the aerospace company North American. After four and a half years, and a little more than a year before first flight, wrote Phillips, there are still significant technical problems and unknowns affecting this stage. Technical problems with electrical power capacity, service propulsion, structural integrity, weight growth, etc., have yet to be resolved. Delayed and compromised ground and qualification test programs give us serious concern that fully qualified flight vehicles will not be available to support the Luna landing program. There is little confidence, concluded Phillips, that North American will meet its schedule and performance commitments within the funds available for this portion of the Apollo program. In this recorded conversation with President Johnson, NASA Administrator Webb can be heard complaining about the lack of funds needed to keep the Apollo program within schedule. Well, I mean, these people have got to fly and put men up there, and uh, it's, uh, it's, awful, it's awfully hard to go to North America and say, we're going to cut you... Uh, back 130 million under your own estimate of doing the work and demand even more work for 130 million less and you got to find a way to do it. Instead of being resolved, the problems denounced by Phillips kept piling up, sending the cost tally into a seemingly endless spiral. A fuel tank from the command module exploded during a test. The environmental control system of the command module didn't work and had to be redesigned from scratch. The second stage of the Saturn rocket had exploded once in 1965, and then again in 1966, considerably delaying the program itself. Cracks had been found in the structure of the rocket and in the fuel tanks. The Luna module design was also progressing among continuous problems and consequent delays. They find hundreds of problems, things that weren't built right, weren't installed right, electrical wires that are frayed, possibly broken, and most alarming of all, there are fuel leaks everywhere in the system. This brings us to 1967, the year of the crisis. In January of that year, Thomas Barron, a North American inspector in charge of security verifications, presented a 50-page report revealing that the problems denounced by Phillips had been anything but resolved. Among the most prominent issues, Barron listed difficulties with people, parts, equipment, and procedures, not to mention poor safety practices and the accidents they caused. In particular, Barron denounced a lack of coordination between people in responsible positions, a lack of communication between almost everyone. The fact that people in responsible positions did not take many of the problems seriously. Barron then added, we should not compromise the safety of the astronauts just for the benefit of a schedule. As if to confirm Barron's premonitions, on January 20, the rocket that was supposed to take the first manned flight into orbit exploded during the testing phase. And then, seven days later, tragedy struck. During a ground simulation of Apollo 1, the first Saturn mission with men on board, the three astronauts, Virgil Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee, died on the launch pad, burned alive inside the capsule that was supposed to take them into space three weeks later. Just moments before his death, Grissom had complained about the malfunctioning of the communications between the capsule and the control tower. Hey, how are you get the moon? We can't talk between three buildings. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Jesus Christ. They were his last words. A few seconds later, a blaze engulfed the interior of the cabin, which was pressurized with pure oxygen. The first to call out the fire was white. Then came the desperate scream from Chaffee. Then nothing else. In a few seconds, it was all over. 
The Apollo program was suspended indefinitely, even before a single capsule had been launched into space. The technical commission charged with discovering the cause of the fire was entrusted to astronaut Frank Borman. At the end of the investigation, it was concluded that the Apollo capsule needed to be redesigned from top to bottom. This added another year of delay to the already tight program schedule. At that point, many felt that the Apollo program was over even before it started. That was quite a shock. I almost had to pull over to the side of the road, catch my breath, because I thought, well, this is, this is the end of our future. The program started to just churn, churn and churn and churn. With the months passing fast, the 1969 deadline was getting closer and closer. In March 1967, NASA Administrator James Webb testified in front of the House Committee on Science and Astronautics. This was a very different person from the one who had enthusiastically supported President Kennedy's project six years before. But my own judgment, declared Webb, is that if we get this done by the end of 1969, we will be very, very fortunate. The possibility of doing all the work necessary is less this year than it was last. And I testified at this table last year that it was less at that time than it had been the previous year. In other words, according to the director of NASA himself, the closer they were getting to the end of the decade, the more the dream of reaching the moon was slipping away. And one year after these statements, the same James Webb suddenly quit NASA. The man who had inspired Kennedy from the beginning, the man who personally rewarded the astronauts on their return from the first orbits, the man who had done everything possible to allocate the funds to go to the moon, inexplicably abandoned the project of his life, a step away from its realization. On October 7, 1968, less than three months before the historic Apollo 8 mission around the moon, James Webb retired from NASA and returned to private life. NASA's deputy director, Robert Siemens, had also inexplicably resigned in January of the same year. When the Washington Post asked him, there must be some reason why you're leaving right now, why not stay until you get to the moon? Siemens sternly replied, look, I've been down here seven years. I only intended to stay two. But it's clear that his resignation must have had something to do with a catastrophic situation in which the Apollo program found itself at that point. Possibly even more surprising was the resignation of astronaut Walt Ashura, which came only four days after James Webb's resignation. Shira was one of the legendary Mercury 7, the original group of astronauts that had started the entire space program back in the 50s. He had already flown on both the Mercury Project and the Gemini Project, and given his long experience, he was certainly due to be sent to the moon with the Apollo program at some point. Yet inexplicably, only a few months before the first lunar missions, Shira gave up the possibility of triumphantly crowning his lifelong career and chose to retire instead. Why these people who had dedicated the best part of their professional life to the space program chose to resign just months before the final achievement is a question that remains to be answered. In fact, after the Apollo 1 fire, many at NASA wondered whether they should just stop altogether. But they realized they could no longer withdraw from the race, for they were held hostage by the very challenge they had thrown to the world a few years before. This sentiment was well summarized by Chris Kraft, the former Houston Space Center director. After the fire, I don't think we would have continued had we not made the commitment. The country made the commitment and they would have looked like a bunch of gooks if they hadn't continued on in the eyes of the world and in their competitive position with the, in the Cold War. It is at this point, according to the alternative theory, that the heads of NASA decided to stage in a studio what they would have not been able to achieve in reality, the moon landings of the Apollo missions. After all, by that time, NASA had developed all the technology needed to simulate a complete mission to the moon and back without ever having to leave the Earth. As we will later see, all they would have needed to do was to use the images produced by the simulators to pretend that they had really landed on the moon. There was another reason why the United States could no longer withdraw from their commitment to go to the moon. It was the domestic public opinion, which had been galvanized by a decade of relentless propaganda, in which the conquest of the moon had been sold to the public like something imminent and certain. 
These clips from the propaganda films of the time help us to understand the spirit of the era. Sometime in the future, American astronauts will explore the moon. This is the first of the big Saturn V. Someday it will carry three men and equipment to the moon and back. In a few short years, this scene of man on the moon will be a reality. This is the Apollo command module. The spacecraft like this will one day carry astronauts to the moon and back. This is the lunar module. A similar craft will one day allow two astronauts to sit gently down on the surface of the moon. Kennedy Space Center, a reality in the preparation for manned lunar landings. The press had done its part as well. More and more often, magazines were publishing articles showing modern man projected to the conquest of space. Adventure books set in space multiplied, making the public ever more familiar with the idea of colonizing other planets. For a nation raised in the myth of the Far West, the new space frontier was only the natural extension for their spirit of conquest. Thus, interplanetary rockets, new satellites, and spaceships of all kinds became every day more familiar for the American public. New guides to space were born every day, such as those published by Hammond or by Doubleday, which illustrated the upcoming Apollo missions in utmost detail. There was even a guide to space for elementary teachers. Kids in schools spent their time building their rockets, dreaming of going to the moon one day. If I ever go to the moon, I think it will be very fun. I just hope to go very, very soon, and I hope I'm not really that old. Walt Disney had created an entire section of Disneyland dedicated to space travel called Tomorrowland. Meanwhile, Disney regularly published books and comics in which his most famous characters went into space. Then you had children's coloring books, with Daddy taking his kids to visit the moon. You had model books with cardboard rockets and astronauts' figurines to cut out. You had three-dimensional books describing in detail every aspect of life in a space station. And at the center of everything, there was always the astronaut, the new mythological figure that had replaced the old hero of the West in the popular lore. After 10 years of such relentless propaganda, one thing can be affirmed with certainty. Had NASA not been technically able to send men to the moon, or had it been too risky to do so, they would have had to fake it. They had no alternative at that point. With the entire nation already focused on the new frontier, it would not have been possible to admit the failure of the space project without the U.S. government losing its total credibility in front of its population. This is, in essence, the thesis proposed by Bill Casing, the man who went down in history as the father of the so-called moon hoax theory. The reason I believe that uh, NASA and the government faked the moon landing was basically it was technically impossible to do it. And they simply had to come up with some sort of alternative that they felt the public would believe. Casing was a former employee at Rocketdyne, the company that built the engines for the rockets used in the Apollo program. Only four years after the end of the Apollo missions in 1976, Casing published a book called We Never Went to the Moon, in which he listed the various reasons why he believed it was not possible for man to have gone to the moon. Casing maintained that the entire series of the moonwalks had been filled in a secret NASA facility instead. Casing's book caused quite a stir and was followed a few years later by a similar book written by independent researcher Ralph Rene. His book was called NASA Mooned America. In particular, Rene claimed that it would have been impossible for the astronauts to safely get across the Van Allen belts, the two radioactive belts located around the Earth that one needs to traverse in order to reach the moon. There is absolutely no way they went to the moon with what they had. In fact, there's no way they can go today. There's no way they can go tomorrow. You don't send man where you haven't sent the monkey. As time went by, the theories proposed by Casing and Rene began to gain traction. But it was only with the advent of the internet that the so-called moon hoax theory began to spread at a worldwide level. 
Since the internet, NASA has placed all the pictures taken by the astronauts online in high definition. All the films and TV recordings from the same missions have also been published through their official distributor, a company called Spacecraft Films. Thanks to all this material, any independent researcher can now personally examine all the original footage and pictures from the Luna missions. This has generated a flurry of highly researched books and documentaries that seriously question the fact that man has gone to the moon. Hollywood has also played its part in reinforcing the idea that men never went to the moon. In 1979, only 10 years after the first Luna mission, the film Capricorn One was released. Officially, the film told the story of a fake mission to Mars, which NASA staged in a TV studio in order to avoid the real dangers of a mission in space. You don't really think you're gonna get away with this? Well, I don't know, it's a chance. Maybe it's not a very good one, but it's a chance. But Capricorn One was clearly referring to the recent Luna missions, as in fact the film's slogan read, Would you be shocked to find out that the greatest moment in our recent history may not have happened at all? The producers didn't mince words when suggesting that NASA could have easily fooled the entire world with the fake Apollo missions. I believe, had they wanted to, that NASA could indeed have pulled off the greatest hoax of all time, never sent anyone to the moon, and recreated it in a television studio. If they were able to make it look real with a budget of only $4 million, suggested the producers, the same could have certainly been done by NASA, which had practically unlimited funds and resources. Capricorn One. And Capricorn One is not the only Hollywood film to have suggested that the lunar landings were filmed on Earth. In the James Bond movie, Diamonds Are Forever, Sean Connery accidentally finds himself running across a movie set where the lunar landings are being staged. There he is, behind the rock! Come on! What the hell is this, amateur night? Stop him, Harry! In the animated movie The Minions, released in 2015, the group of characters also accidentally comes across a movie set where the Apollo missions are being filmed. And in yet another Hollywood blockbuster, The Coneheads, the famous comedy with Dan Aykroyd, the producers openly made fun of the idea that men really went to the moon. Chicken embryos, seasoned patties of ground animal flesh. Mm, I'm not really hungry, just some tang. Ah, tang, the drink the astronauts took to the moon. Astronauts to the moon. <laughs> Obviously, there are also those who are absolutely convinced that we went to the moon and openly defend the official narrative by NASA. These people like to call themselves debunkers. Among the best known and most active, we should mention Phil Plate, editor of the website Bad Astronomy, Jim Ober, journalist and expert in space issues, the Italian Paolo Attivissimo, editor of the website on the moon hoax and collaborator of the Apollo Lunar Journal, NASA's official website on the Apollo missions. As an official NASA collaborator, Attivissimo represents a particularly authoritative voice in the field of the Luna debate. Among the debunkers, we should also mention Jay Windley, editor of the website Clavius, and the world-famous Mythbusters, who have devoted an entire episode from their show to debunking the so-called moon hoax theory. Not only do these people believe that we went to the moon, but they claim that there is irrefutable evidence to prove it. We shall therefore begin by analyzing this evidence one item at a time. The first piece of evidence commonly cited in favor of the Apollo missions comes in the form of reasoning. If it's true that NASA faked the moon landings, goes the argument, why did the Russians keep mum instead of exposing the hoax to the entire world? The Russians were zitti perché? There are, in fact, different reasons why the Russians would not have exposed the fake landings in any case. The first one is that, given their position, no one in the world would have believed them. Just imagine if the Russians, who had just lost the race to the moon, had tried to suggest that NASA faked the moon landings. The Americans would have ridiculed them in front of the entire world, calling them sore losers. With more than a half a billion people having just witnessed the moon landings on television, it would have been very easy to dismiss any Russian accusation with a laugh. 
Had the claim come from a neutral nation, then maybe it would have been somewhat believable. But coming from the same people who had just lost the race to the moon, no one would have taken them seriously. There is also a second, very important reason why the Russians would not have exposed the hoax in any case. With the Apollo mission still in progress, serious talks between the Americans and the Russians about a joint space program had already been on their way. The times were no longer those of Kennedy and Khrushchev, and the Nixon administration had made some serious progress towards a substantial detente with the Soviet Empire. We have opened a new relation with the Soviet Union. We must continue to develop and expand that new relationship so that the two strongest nations of the world will live together in cooperation rather than confrontation. On May 24th, 1972, in Moscow, with the Apollo mission still in full swing, Richard Nixon signed a historic agreement with the Soviets on space cooperation. And less than a year after the last Apollo mission, the same American astronauts were traveling to Russia to meet their Soviet colleagues. They took part in joint press conferences, visited their space center, got familiar with their spaceship Soyuz, and paid homage to the grave of the heroes of the Soviet space program, Sergei Korolev and Yuri Gagarin. A few months later, it was the Soviet cosmonauts' turn to visit the U.S. and get acquainted with the American way of life. They visited the Houston Space Center, familiarized with the American spaceship Apollo, and worked together with their counterparts to perfect the system that would allow their spaceships to connect to each other during future joint missions. All of this would culminate only three years after the last Apollo mission in the historic encounter between the American spaceship Apollo and the Russian spaceship Soyuz. These are the words by Soviet cosmonaut Leonov before departing for the joint mission with the Americans in space. Chairman of the State Commission, the crew of the Soyuz spaceship is ready for the joint flight with the American spaceship Apollo. We have the great honor of participating in the first international flight of manned spaceships. The fulfillment of this experiment will yield still broader possibilities in our space research. On the American side, the tone of the comments was just as appeasing. The mission climaxed more than three years of planning and preparation, a time during which differences in language, in technology, in political creed were set aside in favor of the common goal. In fact, the joint mission between the Russians and the Americans would pave the way to what is today the International Space Station, a place where astronauts from the U.S., Russia, Italy, Japan, and many other countries work elbow to elbow in the International Space Program. In conclusion, had the Russians exposed the lunar hoax by the Americans, not only would the entire world have laughed at them, but nothing of what followed in terms of space cooperation with the Americans would have ever been possible. Faced with a possible bluff by the Americans, all there would have been left for the Russians to do was to bite the bullet and look at the future with a smile on their face. As all philosophers say, the best part of a good dinner is not what you eat, but with whom you eat. The second piece of evidence often used in favor of the moon landings is the following. With over 400,000 people involved in the NASA project, goes the argument, someone sooner or later would have spilled the beans. Private, non militari, non erano operazioni di quattro gatti che lanciano un missile. Quindi tutta questa gente in 40 anni non ha mai confessato nulla. But it's the very premise to this argument that is flawed. Nowhere does it say that all 400,000 NASA employees had to be informed of the scam being perpetrated. In fact, the lunar landing project had been split among thousands of different companies that worked all over the United States, totally independent from one another. The employees from Grumman were building the lunar module in their factories in Long Island. The technicians from ILC were designing the spacesuits in their laboratories in Delaware. The employees from Boeing were building the lunar rover in the state of Washington. The people from McDonnell Douglas worked on the Saturn rocket in their factories in California. The technicians from General Motors were producing the tanks for the command module at their home in Indiana. The experts from the Link Group developed the flight simulators in their factories in New York. 
As told in this documentary from that era, there were about 20,000 different companies working at the same time on the Apollo project from all over the United States. More than 90% of the work is conducted by contractors spread across the nation. In fact, some 20,000 prime contractors, subcontractors, and suppliers located in virtually every state are participating in the manned spaceflight programs. Thus, the idea that all these people had to be in on a plan to fake the moon landings is simply ludicrous. When a soccer player chooses to sell out a game, he certainly does not inform the rest of his team of his intentions. He acts alone, and the first ones to be duped are, in fact, his own teammates. Another example is the so-called Volkswagen scandal. In 2015, it was revealed that the German automaker had deceived the entire world by selling them cars whose engines exceeded the established emission regulations. But this doesn't mean that the entire body of 600,000 workers at Volkswagen had been informed of the scam being perpetrated. All that was needed was a restricted group of managers and technicians in the know, without everyone else necessarily being informed of what was going on. Also, in the case of the Apollo missions, all that was needed was a small group of NASA's top managers who decided to fake the moon landings, while everyone else at the agency would have believed that the missions were real. For the hoax to succeed, for example, it would have been sufficient to take control of the television signal that was received by the stations on Earth. Officially, the images from the first moonwalk were transmitted directly from the moon and were broadcasted in real time by the television stations all over the world. But if the same moonwalk had been pre-recorded in a studio instead and was then rebroadcast to the receiving stations by a satellite or any other means, then the first people to be duped would have been the very technicians at NASA who were following the moon landings from Houston Space Center. And with them, the entire world would have been deceived. There is also, according to the debunkers, some physical evidence for the moon landings, which they claim to be irrefutable. One such piece of evidence is the presence on the moon of the so-called retro reflector. This is an object capable of returning a laser beam to Earth, which was allegedly left by the astronauts on the surface of the moon. According to the Mythbusters, this retro reflector represents irrefutable and conclusive evidence that man went to the moon, not even using their white shirt as an additional reflector. In any case, the idea that the sand is sufficient to illuminate the shadow area of the land can be easily refuted by using the same NASA pictures. All we need to do is to look at other pictures taken with the same source of light what supposedly is the sun, to realize that the shadow area in these pictures is practically pitch black. If the lunar sand truly had these magical reflecting powers, this part of the rock should more or less have the same luminosity as the terrain in the background. These panels should be almost as visible as the illuminated sand, and this shadow area of the rover would be clearly lit as well. Instead, everything that is not directly illuminated by the sun appears as a deep black shadow. This proves that the sand is not sufficient to brighten up the shadow areas by itself. For this same reason, we can also discard the idea that it was the Earth to illuminate the shadow area of the lamp. If the Earth shine were truly that powerful, all the other shadow areas of the lunar terrain should be illuminated as well. But this is not the case. There is therefore no valid explanation for the practically identical illumination of the area hit directly by the sun and the shadow area of the lamb. In fact, the professional photographers we interviewed believe that in order to achieve such results, large reflecting panels or additional lights placed on the side of the photographer are needed. La tesi, diciamo, sì. eh, del complotto dice siamo sulla luna, non c'è nemmeno il cielo, non c'è l'atmosfera sì. a farti da riflesso. Ormai qui è chiaro, cioè Qui è, questa luce non corrisponde a questa, diciamo. Esatto. In effetti è vero, non corrisponde. Diciamo, guardandolo attentamente da un punto di vista, diciamo dovrebbe esserci un pannello bianco qua, eh, perché la luce sia così. Cioè, questo qui, ma neanche se tu sei in riva al mare, hai un riverbero, hai una cosa che, che, che va così, a, con la luce così protetta, ma questo in effetti è veramente incredibile. Anche qui, guarda che dettaglio c'è qui, 
cioè dove c'è la luce è bene, dove c'è l'ombra è, è questione di un caso, c'è un buco nero, invece qui eh, avrebbe senso se qua ci fossero tutti dei pannelli di polistirolo, ma grandi però, sì, eh, caspita, cioè... È possibile avere, senza l'atmosfera che fa del riflesso, un controluce con esposizione quasi uguale qui e qui, in luce diretta e in luce riflessa? Ci vuole un riflettore, insomma, un controluce così. È chiaro che ci sono delle riflessi qui, di, di, del metallo, che vuol dire che c'è una, una sorgente di luce dalla parte di chi fotografa. Lo vedo soprattutto nei riflessi qui, no? Vuol dire che da questa parte qui c'è una sorgente di luce. No, non c'è l'aria da sole. Non c'è la questa, per esempio, tutto questo c'è un'aria da lampada di studio. Questo schiarimento qui, c'è cioè questa luce sulla scala, per esempio, da dove viene? Quello che mi impressiona è che il sole, un controluce così, in più riesco a vedere i dettagli di questo riflesso su questo oro. Da dove viene? Perché qui il cielo è nero. Il cielo è nero, non c'è. L'unica riflessione è la sabbia, però dovrebbe essere molto più luminosa sotto e non sopra. Questo riflesso sopra qui da dove viene? A meno che abbiamo portato dentro grandi riflettori, ma non credo. Insomma. La luce viene da dietro al modulo, no? L'astronauta, o presunto tale, è al buio totale e è illuminato. Perché? C'è un'altra luna o c'è qualcuno con un faro? Voglio dire, perché tanta così qui? E, e, e tanta così nella parte buia più che altro. Da dove viene questa luce? Qui dovrebbe essere completamente nera, come il cielo. Quindi diciamo senza sorgenti secondarie, senza riflettori non sarebbe possibile? No, questo è impossibile. Verrebbe nero come qui. No. E, poi, e poi guarda, si vede anche dalla scaletta di metallo, no? E c'è un riflesso di una luce, vedi? Questa riga bianca è il riflesso di una luce. Quindi da questa parte c'è una luce. The main problem here is backlight. On the moon you have no sky behind you to re uh, refract the light and you only have the sand. They did not have any artificial illumination. They did not have any reflectors or any flashes, just a camera which was Hasselblad uh, with the 60 millimeters and the ectochrome from the good old days. I was, I was feeling if this is happening, where is this coming from? And if, if I was already thinking when I saw the first picture that that yeah. when you step okay, down skip. here, um, if you step down in a light like this, you will never have that reflection like this, even if it comes from here. Yeah. Huh? Yes. Now that's totally f um, a strange light. Here too, you have uh, you can see they have almost the same luminosity in the front and the back. Now. My experience tells me you have at least two stops difference when you turn around in backlight. And that's when you have the atmosphere. Yeah, but that is totally lit with the reflector, no? Uh, you tell me. Uh, that's that's the whole that's the whole discussion. I would say that is totally lit. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to get it into it's fake or or, or or the moon landing was fake, but these pictures are fake, no? That is I think I would say hundred percent sure. Okay. Because, because all this cannot exist that way. So if you ask me as a photographer, yes, I, am. <laughs> I have to say this cannot be on any moon or something with one single light. The sun left light is totally, if you see that, I mean, that's a movie light, no? Because you have the source here that should be all black. If it would not be black, then this would be burned out, burned out, burned out. Then you get some texture here. But like this is absolutely impossible. Absolutely impossible. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> That's supposed to be the sun. Does that look like the sun to you? If this is the sun and the only light, and this is how one ever reflects them, which is ridiculous because they can, nothing can reflect this, then this would be so burned out and bleached out not to get any structure here. Like yeah. That's my... Uh, same as the others, I've said the same thing. That would be unbelievable. If this is the sun, 
and there must something be here because that would be just black. So what is it? Yeah, this is um, um, impossible without reflectors. That is really impossible without reflectors. Okay. With this comment, Tarim Burt well summarizes the professional's opinion. Delle foto avevo dovuto essere state fatte sulla luna portandosi un'attrezzatura da studio. Non so se questo ha molto senso. Eh, se qua ci fossero dei, dei grandi pannelli bianchi, diciamo, deve essere proprio tutto un, tutto un set con tu, tutto ben riflesso, diciamo. And maybe it's not a coincidence that on the set of the IMAX film, large reflecting panels were used right behind the lamb in order to replicate the NASA pictures. A source of light placed behind the Luna module and large reflecting panels used to bounce the light onto the dark area of the lamb. By using this technique, the luminosity in the shadow area is perfectly balanced with the one of the terrain illuminated directly by the source. Exactly like in the Apollo pictures. In 2014, the NVIDIA software company created a computer simulation thanks to which they believed to have identified the source of light that could have brightened the shadow area of the lamb. In their opinion, it was the photographer's white suit, Neil Armstrong himself. There is a huge, glowing, bright white light. And as we analyzed that video a little more, we realized it's Neil Armstrong himself. The bright white space suit that he was wearing reflected all that sunlight off of him and back onto Buzz Aldrin. So essentially, Neil Armstrong himself was a light source in that scene. But the professional photographers explain how the white suit could at best partially brighten up the companion's figure. But it's too small and too far away to be able to illuminate the entire shadow area of the lamp. È possibile teoricamente che la tuta dell'astronauta che fotografa, che è bianca, riesca a fare questo controluce? Perché è una possibilità che è stata... No, beh, allora, il bianco fa, il bianco fa. Però a questa distanza è un po' tanto, è un po' distante. Cioè se, se fosse, diciamo, qui, allora sì, ma poi comunque farebbe, diciamo, illuminerebbe una parte molto più piccola. Ecco, qui l'unica cosa di riflesso può essere questa superficie chiara su cui si riflette l'ombra del modello, no? Sì. Però questa superficie non è sufficiente, ecco qua la vediamo meglio, sì. non è sufficiente per illuminare il lamp come è illuminato, insomma. Potrebbe essere la tuta dell'astronauta che fotografa? No, lui... troppo lontano. Certamente. Troppo piccolo e troppo lontano. Lui sarebbe a 10 metri circa e non fa niente. In order to conclusively discard this hypothesis, all one has to do is to look at the television images from the very Apollo missions. Here, for example, there is an astronaut hit by sunlight who is moving right outside the edge of the frame. We can see how the reflection from his white suit partially brightens the underside of the rover, but does absolutely nothing to the lamb in the shadow, which is much larger and far away. Here, the same astronaut enters the field of view from the right. And again, the light he reflects goes to partially brighten the underside of the rover, but it has no effect whatsoever on the darkened mass of the lunar module. And finally, there is another detail suggesting the use of a secondary source of light, either a reflecting panel or a small flashlight. And it's this shiny glare repeatedly appearing on the heels of the astronaut's boots. Qui c'è una luce. La sabbia che c'è intorno. No, no, no. No, questa è puntiforme, vedi, piccola. Anche questo, di nuovo, stesso problema. C'è questo dettaglio in questo, dentro questa ombra nera, praticamente impossibile. Tecnicamente impossibile. No, appunto, il dettaglio sulle scarpe, il dettaglio sul metallo. Qui, indubbiamente, questa riflessione, questa riflessione vuol dire che c'è una sorgente di luce dalla parte di chi fotografo, mentre in realtà il sole è dietro, a questo incontro luce. Forse è un flash, no? No? Potrebbe. No, se io, no, diciamo, no, se io avessi usato un flash a me veniva così. Sì, appunto, forse un flash, perché no? E c'è un'area da, un da flash, un piccolo flash sulla macchina fotografica. The same here. <laughs> And it's true, you see them in the, in the shoes, you see the reflectors, no? Huh? You do? Can you show me again? And... Yeah, the, those, where does this light come from? Well, in, the, in the shoes, you have that, that shine. This. 
Yeah, the shoes. See, that's the shoes he's going to see. Right? <laughs> that's your... Could that be a flashlight? A flashlight or a reflector or anything, you know? Yeah. Given NASA's statement that since the lunar surface itself is a poor reflector, the subject material for photography will be either in full light or in full and complete shadows, can you explain why the side of the lem in the shadow is brightly illuminated instead? As we have just shown, the reflection from the sand is not sufficient to brighten up the parts in the shadow of the lunar landscape, and the astronaut's suit is too small and too far away to brighten up the dark side of the lem. Can you then explain what source of light has managed to illuminate so clearly the dark side of the lunar module? Given that the lunar soil reflects only 8% of the light it receives, how is it possible that the shadow area of the LEM, which is lit only by reflected light, has a similar luminosity to the terrain hit directly by the sun? Given that not even the Mythbusters, with their experiment, have managed to balance the reflected light with the one hitting the terrain, can you explain how that could have happened with several of the Apollo pictures? Given that the professional photographers we interviewed have stated that these pictures would not have been possible without the aid of reflecting panels and additional lighting, can you explain how they could have been taken by the astronauts on the moon, who didn't have any reflecting panels nor additional lighting? Faced with this apparent falsification of the lunar pictures, several people have suggested an extreme possibility that man did go to the moon, but the pictures were later reshot here on Earth because for some reason they had not turned out properly the first time around. But this is not possible for at least two reasons. First of all, the use of studio lighting is evident in all the different missions, from Apollo 11 to Apollo 17. One would have to explain what exactly the photographic problem was that would have forced NASA to reshoot all these pictures in a studio for six missions out of six. Secondly, anyone can verify how the photographs and the television pictures match each other perfectly in that every single detail present in the television pictures is also present in the photographs. This means that both the pictures and the television images were shot at the same time and in the same place. In other words, the set is the same for the pictures and for the TV images. And since the television images have always been broadcast live, this means that also the photographs must have been taken at the same time and not later. Or possibly before, if the television scenes were pre-recorded in a studio, but certainly not after the date of the live broadcast. At this point, we are left with only one consideration to make. If it's true, like all this evidence seems to suggest, that someone at NASA decided to fake the lunar landings, they would have certainly needed to convince the astronauts to play their role all the way through to the end. It could not have been possible to fake the lunar landings without their full cooperation. And astronauts are some exceptional people, courageous and motivated by a deep sense of pride, which comes from constantly putting their lives at risk in order to advance the progress of science. It must have not been easy for them to participate in such a fraud, just to satisfy the need of the United States to affirm their leadership in front of the entire world. Let's then take a closer look at the story of the three most famous astronauts of all, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins, the historical crew of Apollo 11. On July 24, 1969, astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins triumphantly returned from the most important mission ever accomplished in human history. They have just been on the moon. They are the first human beings to have ever visited another celestial body and to have safely returned from it. On the recovery ship, they are welcomed by President Nixon in person. After a brief exchange in front of the cameras, Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins are placed in quarantine for a few weeks of isolation. Then on September 16, they appear for a press conference in front of the global members of the press who welcome them with a standing ovation. Everyone expects to see three absolute heroes radiating with happiness and pride for their incredible achievement. But their faces appear somber tense, somehow preoccupied instead. They seem uncomfortable, and there are several truly embarrassing moments during the event. 
when the three astronauts are asked the meaning of a mission that has brought mankind on another celestial body for the first time, the three don't seem too eager nor too enthusiastic about answering the question. Uh, many of us and uh, many other people in many places have speculated on the meaning of this first landing on another body in space. Would each of you give us uh, your estimate of what is the meaning of this to all of us? And when Armstrong describes their achievement as the beginning of a new era, he seems more like a person forced to read from a script than someone actually convinced of his own words. The entire program, it's uh, a beginning of a new age. Possibly the most embarrassing moment of all comes when the famous astronomer and journalist Sir Patrick Moore asks the astronauts whether they could see stars from the moon. When you looked up at the sky, could you actually see the stars and the solar corona in spite of the glare? But not one of them, surprisingly, remembers having seen a single star by the naked eye. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Even Collins, who was left orbiting the moon while the other two descended on the surface, does not remember seeing a single star. I don't remember seeing any. This is a truly disconcerting fact, given that their colleagues from the Gemini missions, who flew in space a few years before them, recall the long hours spent looking at the stars. We'd spend uh, several hours uh, just with our faces pressed up against the window at night with all the lights turned down low, and watching the stars. Also, the astronauts from the shuttle missions, like, for example, James Riley, recall seeing literally millions of stars in outer space. What are the stars like in space? Like, are they just brighter than on Earth, or how, how would you describe it? The, they're brighter, but they're different. And a lot of things different about it. One, you don't have the atmospheric distortion, so they don't twinkle, right? So you see lots of points, and you see lots of points, and that literally millions of them. One wonders where the Apollo 11 astronauts have truly been in the crucial eight days of their mission, given that they don't remember seeing a single star by naked eye. Another surprising fact is that, instead of pursuing a successful career within NASA, after their triumphant mission, the three astronauts suddenly decided to leave the space agency. A little over a year after their mission, with the Apollo program still in full swing, all three astronauts resigned from NASA Armstrong literally disappears from the scene, moves to the country, decides not to give any more interviews, and shuns the public eye. And when NASA celebrates the completion of the Apollo program, which has carried 12 men to the moon in the course of three years, the most important of all, Neil Armstrong refuses to take part in the ceremony. Buzz Aldrin also falls into a deep state of depression, which leads him towards the abuse of drugs and alcohol. I thrived on addictive substances, uh, alcoholism, and clearly that began to predominate in my unstructured life. In 1973, he appears in a photo in Parry Match, definitely changed in his physical aspect. To the French magazine, Aldrin declares, they think of us as heroes, but the moon has destroyed us. In a 1994 interview, Aldrin is asked to give some advice to the young people who want to become astronauts in the future. But instead of encouraging them and inspiring them with enthusiasm, he warns them against possible disappointments. Space uh, and its uh, frontiers certainly are new and, and challenging. Uh, and because they're new and challenging, they're also uncertain. And I think anyone aspiring that as a career field has to be equipped with a lot of patience and the ability to cope with uh, things not turning out exactly the way they may perceive that they would ahead of time. Why would a man who has just accomplished the most important mission in the history of mankind warn young people against the risk of disappointments and failures? Ladies and gentlemen, Neil Armstrong. Armstrong sometimes reappears in public, but it's definitely not to sing a praise for NASA. In a ceremony hosted by Bill Clinton in 1994, Armstrong makes an ambiguous and mysterious statement. While talking to a group of students, he mentions some of truth's protective layers that young people should try to remove in order to go on. We leave you much that is undone. There are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove 
one of truth's protective layers. Later on, Armstrong stuns reporters again when he refuses to take part in the celebrations of the 40th anniversary of the Apollo mission. In 2004, filmmaker Bart Sibrell produces a documentary called Astronauts Gone Wild, in which he interviews the astronauts from the Apollo missions Instructional trail The only way I know how hard I can weigh oh. Eaten with one fork and knife I might die, I'll oh. take the rest of my life oh.
No one can look so far. No one can pretend the future. Still, I want to step on Mars. No one can bend the stars. Half of the world does use a telephone. Yet. And over here, a new generation born with internet. Facing a mass revolution that takes all progress. We fold the all around the workers. Less responsibility, no more offices. The world has a first space. This is what you face. successful and we will be. <laughs>